Hi, and welcome to the X-22 Report Spotlight. Today, we have a returning guest, Charles Hughes Smith. Charles is a financial writer, a book author. He's the creator and owner of charleshughesmith.blogspot.com and of twominds.com. And I am very happy to have Charles back on the X-22 Report Spotlight. Charles, welcome back to the Spotlight. Thank you, Dave. It's always my pleasure to be on your program. Hey, it's always my pleasure to have you back on here. And I really enjoy talking with you. And I wanted to start start off with the economy. Uh, I think this is on a lot of people's minds of what's happening since we have a new president now, and people are seeing very strange things in the economy where they might not have been watching this very closely in the past, because the first quarter of this year, I mean, of course, coming off of Obama, he pretty much told us that, you know, he's handing off a strong economy to Trump. But the first quarter, we see GDP at 0.7%. The Fed is saying this is an anomaly. This is not what the economy is really doing. It's going to get a lot better as we move forward throughout this year. But then we see, you know, retail, well, that's not doing very well. Housing, really not doing well. In your mind, how do you actually think the economy is doing? Is I mean, has it improved? Is it getting worse? Is this an anomaly? What's your opinion on this whole thing? I think the, the answer must has to start from some sort of context. Like, what are we looking for when we, you know, try to answer that question? Are we looking at GDP, unemployment? You know, there's a lot of these usual sort of statistics, right, which are supposed to be measures of growth, right? And growth is supposed to be good because without growth, then, you know, the the economy falls apart, right? But I think uh, maybe the maybe just as important as so-called growth, um, it's uh, income, right? It's earned income, it's wages and salaries. Like, are people getting more money? Is their purchasing power increasing or is it decreasing? And I think um, the answer to, to your excellent question is the economy is not improving because the, the, for 95% of the households, their incomes are actually declining in terms of their purchasing power, right? Um, in other words, inflation is eating away at, you know, three, four, five, six, seven, eight percent, depending on, you know, what you're looking at. But, uh, you know, the, uh, the actual earnings are either stagnant or actually declining, like people are, are making less money. So how can the economy be doing better if 95 percent of the people are earning less money, right? I don't, I don't, I don't think that can, I don't think you can claim the economy is doing better. So then you have to ask, well, then, then why does it appear to be doing better? And of course, we all know the answer is people are borrowing money to fill the gap between their cost of living and their earnings. So you think right now that people are, I guess what you're saying, they're using credit cards or maybe taking out loans on their homes just to get by today? That seems to be the case because, uh, you know, the the uh, Fed, I think, just released some statistic that said consumer credit, which includes credit cards, um, auto loans, you know, um, student loan debt, uh, mortgages, the whole thing is, uh, I don't know, 12.7%. Uh, trillion. It's exceeded the previous uh, bubble top. So clearly credit is increasing and and yet wages are stagnant. So why are people borrowing more money? And, um, you know, anecdotally, we hear we hear stories of people uh, taking a class at the local community college. So they qualify for a student loan, which they then use to live on. And um, and you can say, well, maybe that's not typical. But um, I think we have to ask, how come credit is rising and and yet wages are stagnant or down what's the credit being used for and um then you read statistics that a third of all households uh, can't even um don't even have 500 dollars saved up for an emergency and you go well you know how do we reconcile these 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 uh, statistics and the the only answer is people are using credit to to pay their bills you know, it's funny because on the corporate media, when they mention like credit and, you know, that's growing and it's it's good because it's it's helping the economy, they, they make it seem like if debt is rising, that is helping. And that means the economy is strong. Uh, do you see do you see that as a positive or do you see that as a negative? I think we have to dig down a little bit and go, who's benefiting from this um, and who's um, who's suffering from this? Right. So when credit expands, of course, The businesses that are making the sales are benefiting and then the government is benefiting because they, they, they're collecting sales tax and income tax and, you know, all, all the taxes that go with, um, 
increasing sales and profits. But what about the person taking on the debt? And, and of course, that's what the media doesn't talk about. And so um, maybe we should we can go back and look at, uh, you know, the, the global financial meltdown in 2008, 2009, right, which which triggered uh, a global recession. And then in response, then um, governments uh, borrowed more money and, and spent more money, right, fiscal stimulus. And then the central banks uh, created money out of thin air and pumped it into the financial system, uh, monetary stimulus. And the, the basic idea here uh, in, in the Keynesian philosophy is to bring consumption forward, right? It's, it's to make it so cheap and easy for you to borrow money that instead of waiting five years to buy a car, you'll go buy one right now. And instead of replacing your your furniture, you know, in three years, you're going to buy a, a new sofa now, you know. And so what happens, though, of course, is eventually that the snake eats its tail, right? In other words, we run out of the, the future becomes now and there's no more consumption to bring forward. Everybody that could afford a car and wanted a car already bought a car. Everybody that wanted a new bed bought a bed, you know, and so. That's what I see here when you mention retail and housing starting to falter is people have already, uh, they've maxed out their borrowing power and because their incomes are stagnant, they no longer have the ability to borrow more money, even at 1%. I mean, if, you, if you're tapped out and you, 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 most of your income's going to pay debt you already have, you can't go borrow more money. And so that's why the economy's uh, starting to falter. And I guess that's why they keep reaching further and further down into the subprime market to find additional people to bring them in and let them borrow because they keep changing the calculation. They're saying, oh, this won't count on your credit score. And we can see just from the automobile um, industry, you know, they're bringing in a lot of subprime people just to move the cars and get them out there. And we see the automobile industry, they're having a problem right now. That's an excellent example. Uh, Dave of, of the of the process you know that it used to be uh, you needed at least 600 on your credit score or something to be considered credit worthy and uh, from what I what I've read recently that uh, credit scores of 400 were, were good enough to to, to get you a new car <laughs> so uh, clearly the problem here you know is when you extend credit to marginal borrowers and and this is not just consumers but also businesses, right? Uh, I mean, if you're going to loan to a company that's really highly leveraged already, that's got a ton of debt, that's a marginal loan too, you know? So all this debt is it, to marginal borrowers. They're the first ones to default, right? Last ones on the, the credit engine and first ones off, right? Because of any kind of little blip in their income, then they default. And then, then it's like, well, then how do we deal with those losses? And of course, we've learned in the last 15 years and, and the crash, you know, the, the bubble and crash that we've gone through in 2000, 2001, and then again in 2008, 2009, and here we are at the top of another credit bubble. What happens is the gains from loaning all that money were privatized, right? Like everybody that wrote all those and, and serviced all those student loans, that trillion, over trillion dollars, they've already pocketed their gains, right? Now, when the defaults start happening, then those are socialized, meaning they, they come back to the government, right? The government has to backstop all these losses. And, um, that, and so then the taxpayers are stuck with it. And so it looks like that seems to be what, what's looming ahead. And, of course, that's a drag, right, on the, on the whole economy, right? When the taxpayer has to pick up the tab, then it, 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 it pressures government spending. And the government can't spend as much as it maybe as people would like on services because now it has to pick up the tab on all this defaulted debt. You mentioned the student loan market and bubbles, and we know the student loan market, it's in, it's in the trillions, and you mentioned it before where people are taking loans out just to live and, and they're living on it. And what's very interesting about the student loan market is that when it first came out, you know, it was a way to pay for college where you didn't have the money, you went to college, and you got out of college and you got a job and you'd be able to pay back your student loan. But in the past, you know, eight years or so, the student loan market, you know, is that bubble is blowing up and many individuals coming out of school, they can't find work and they're living with their parents. They're getting part-time jobs. 
and they can't pay back their student loans. And, you know, they go through these loan modifications where now it's tied to your income. So if you're making a you know low income, they project it out over time and that's what your payments are going to be. But now it seems like the situation is getting even worse because there is a bill that has been submitted that if you are bankrupt and you can't find a job, you have no income coming in, you'll be able to wipe out your student loan. Before, you couldn't do that. Now you'll be able to. So my question to you is what happens when this starts to happen where they're just wiping out the student loan debt? Who picks up the tab? Who's responsible? Because it just doesn't disappear. Someone has to pay for it. That's right, Dave. And and that's an excellent point that's often missed in all the mainstream media and the financial media is, oh, the losses. No one ever talks about the fact that the losses have to be absorbed somewhere. You know, they don't just disappear into thin air. Somebody has to pay uh, for that loss. And so the thing about the student loan racket, and and I think we, we really should use the word racket, is because the original concept was private lenders would 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 fund these uh, student loans, right? And so the risk would be on them. And within the eight-year period you talked about or the last decade, then the federal government changed the rules so that these are non-recourse loans, right? Meaning they can't be um, dissolved in um, in bankruptcy. So now we start seeing this circle that's that's fraud, really. You can call it a racket. You can call it, uh, you know, fraud. It, it's something like that because the lender can't lose money, right? Because the government will backstop it and and say, oh no, we're going to guarantee all student loans and, and you're going to get your money back. And so the, the, the lenders have a guaranteed profit. And then um, the students are trapped, at least until this bill you mentioned passes, they're, they're trapped under this debt that they can't escape, right? And, and then the federal government backstops it. So um, where, where it used to be private uh, lending, right? And I have a chart that I've posted many times on my site that shows the federal government's share or ownership of student loans skyrocketed from basically nothing to uh, over a trillion dollars now. So all that debt that other that private lenders profited from is now on the government's books. And so when so when five hundred billion of uh, is written off or defaulted on uh, out of that trillion, then it's the the taxpayer who's going to take the loss, right? And so, um, is that fair? And you go, uh, well, uh, you know, it, clearly it's not. It's not fair. Like the risk uh, should have been um, attributed to the lender, right? And so the lender made a loan that's risk free, and now the government um, is uh, picking up the tab, and um, and the students are kind of caught in this uh, no man's land at, at, the, at this point, right? They, um, and so it's a typical, I think it's an example of why our financial system is broken, right? Is that, that losses are privatized, I mean, gains are privatized, and then when the losses show up, those are socialized and handed back to the government. That, that is true. And we can see, I mean, just from the student loan market, from the automobile market, from the housing market, from the stock market to the bond market, I mean, all of these are just gigantic bubbles waiting to just pop. And some of them are deflating right now. Like we see the housing market where we see uh, new construction sales, they've declined. Existing home sales, they declined. So is this free money that the central banks have been creating over time, has this actually helped the economy at all? And let's look at housing. And so we now have like housing prices are back up to where they were in, in much of the country uh, to the 2000, you know, seven, eight bubble, right? And so that, um, increase in in housing value has certainly helped people who um, bought you know at lower prices, but it's made it unaffordable for um, Gen X and Gen Y, right? In other words, people who are entering the housing market in their 20s and 30s, it's like housing at, on the left and right coast is is really expensive, and so it's no longer affordable. So there's this um, generational imbalance or asymmetry, right? Like um, those people who own their house free and clear or have a small mortgage, the, you know, their wealth has, has risen. But then what about younger people? They, they're, they've they been priced out of the market. And so we can see how the, the monetary authorities are, they're caught in this sort of um, uh, 
between a rock and a hard place because if they let housing prices decline then um, to where they're affordable again, well, then, then um, all the people holding their wealth in their house suffer a huge hit to their, their home equity, right? And so you, you can't have it both ways. In other words, if you're going to make housing unaffordable for young families, then it's going to roll over because no one can afford it, right? But if, if you let it fall, then suddenly you've got a, a, a reverse uh, wealth effect, right, where people are seeing their, their home equity decline they're, they're going to, you know, feel less like borrowing and spending money, right? Like I'm, po- I'm getting poorer, not richer, right? So you can't have it both ways. And so that's, that's why um, we're seeing housing uh, stagnate is there's no, nobody's left who can afford it except foreign buyers, right? Coming in, fleeing capital controls and, and, and the, the problems in their, in their home economies. They're rushing here to buy homes um, in North America, you know, with cash, and so that's propping up the market in, um, you know, Toronto and Vancouver and, and uh, other other markets uh, for sure. So, but take that away, and and who can afford housing in America? So, do you think the housing market is rolling over now? Well, at least anecdotally, I'm uh, I'm I'm sure you're seeing stories like this too. That um, that sales in in really high priced areas like Manhattan and San Francisco are declining by like 15 20 percent right right and so it seems like we're the the pool of potential buyers must be shrinking because sales are 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 declining by significant percentages and um, uh, so and and I suppose we should say that this is of course um, housing is always local right we can't judge the entire u.s market on on manhattan or san francisco and it's still cheap in in places like you know uh the the upper midwest right you can still buy a home for fifty thousand dollars you know in a in a pretty nice small town but then the problem is where where's your job you know uh where's the employment so um but yeah i think i think we could sort of summarize this going back to your original question is credit growth the, really the, the, the measure of a healthy economy or is it actually the measure of a stagnating economy in decline where people are borrowing more money than they should just to, um, to buy overpriced assets like houses and, and just to uh, keep their head above water? Do you think everything the central bank has done since the, I, I guess it was 2008, up until this point in time, do you think this has actually improved the economy? Or do you think that they never fixed the problems and they just basically covered up everything that happened in 2008 and here we are in 2017? Yeah, I think you're right, Dave. I think they just uh, kind of papered it over uh, because debt, uh, all, all debt, right, uh, public, private, corporate, has more or less doubled, you know, in, in, in these eight years. So we've taken on a huge amount of additional debt um, on all levels, and yet people's incomes have barely uh, clicked up, if at all. In fact, for most people, uh, their income has actually declined, you know, because it's stagnated and inflation has has eaten away uh, their purchasing power. So we actually have less money and and more debt. Well, that's not a combination that's um, that's healthy, right? Because the debt just eats away at our future income, right? And and basically all debt is borrowed from our future income. And so if our income is going down, then um, that's going to inhibit our ability to pay all that, that debt going forward. And so then defaults seem inevitable, right? In other words, and then there's losses. And then you've got the self-reinforcing cycle where if businesses, you know, are making less money and, and uh, s- selling less product and and uh, services, then they have to lay off people, right? And so then we can look ahead and go, wow, well, what happens when we finally get a real business cycle recession here and um, people are being laid off? Then and who's going to borrow all this additional money to keep everything afloat? So t- to answer your question, I think the central banks have weakened the economy considerably by increasing the debt load, but they haven't been able to force businesses to um, to trickle down all that all that new money that's flowing into the system down to wages and salaries, right? People, so the the mechanism is broken, and and in the past it was assumed that it was like magic, right? Like in the 1960s or 70s, if sales went up 
and profits went up, well, then people's wages went up too, right? But now we're in this global um, oversupply of labor, and um, that's part of the, the, the negative consequence of globalization, right? Because now we're competing not just against um, other workers in our own uh, states, but we're, we're, uh, we're competing against um, everybody in the world, right? At least for uh, tradable labor. In other words, labor that's um, producing goods and services that can be traded on the, in the global economy. Um, like, in other words, uh, getting a haircut, well, you can't outsource that, right? <laughs> I mean, you, you can fly to China and get a haircut, but that's really expensive. So there's, um, that's why the economist Michael Spence, um, that's why he was given the Nobel Prize, is he, he, he explored this idea that there's tradable labor and then there's untradable labor. So, you know, for having finding somebody to cut your hair or mow your lawn, well, that's, you know, that can't be outsourced. So those jobs are safe, right? But if you're working in a factory or you're working in a service industry that, that can be outsourced, then your, your job is at risk, right? So we have this huge oversupply of labor, and that's why wages around the world are generally stagnating, right? And, and at least in the developed countries. And so you've got basic supply and demand imbalance, right? The demand for labor is less than the supply of labor. And this is why, you know, the whole, the whole college education, you've got to get a degree or else you're unemployable. It's, it's uh, tragic because you can get a degree and unless it's a, a specific uh, specialized degree that happens to be in demand, then you're still unemployable in a lot of cases, right? And so we haven't, the central banks are simply working on this false assumption that if they just pump enough money into the financial system, more people are going to get jobs and wages are going to rise. And the last eight years has proven that to be absolutely false. I mean, they've pumped in trillions of dollars and fiscal stimulus, monetary stimulus, uh, credits gone to the moon, and yet the unemployment rate has gone down, but the number of full-time workers is barely edged higher, you know, in eight years and wages have stagnated for the bottom 95%. So they, they haven't gotten it right. In other words, what they thought would work didn't work. So what do they do now? Well, that's an excellent question. And uh, it's, it's kind of part of this larger debate about deflation and inflation and, uh, some people feel that their only option is to start printing more money and distributing it directly to households. And this is uh, part of the idea of this universal basic income, right? That if people can't ma make ends meet, well, the system is, um, you know, people will revolt, right? They'll, they'll, they'll overthrow their government because they can't make their ends meet, right? This is what history suggests. So the government or the central banks can always just print more trillions and start distributing it um, to the households. You know, every, <clears throat> for instance, every household gets $10,000 more a year, you know, and that's one approach. And of course, the danger there is you're printing a ton of new money, but you're not creating any more goods and services. And so that leads to high inflation. And then you, you eventually you end up like Venezuela, where you know, the Venezuelan currency, the Bolivar used to be 10 to the U.S. dollar, now it's 5,800 to the U.S. dollar. So it basically, you know, once inflation really starts uh, taking hold, then it, it, it impoverishes everybody in the whole economy. So they're really in a, a lot of people feel that the central banks really don't have a, a way out now. You know, they can, they can follow that idea of, of just printing money and distributing it to keep everybody afloat. But then, then you're going to get, eventually you're going to get inflation. Or they can let these um, all these asset bubbles pop, and then that um, that decreases the wealth that people were counting on, right? All that home equity goes away, all that corporate um, corporate equity and stocks goes away. So, and then the system collapses from deflation. <laughs> so there doesn't seem to be a way out, and that's um, that's why people are uh, are concerned. You know that there is no easy way out now. Do you think um, with Trump 
out there saying that he's going to be bringing manufacturing, he's going to be bringing jobs. I mean, he's making these deals. I mean, nothing really happened. He's just out there publicizing that, you know, we're going to be bringing back jobs, we're going to be bringing back manufacturing. And, you know, he lists, you know, how many jobs that they promised, but how can this possibly happen in this economy? I mean, do you see this actually as a possibility? Well, that's a great topic, um, Dave. And, and, and to answer, we have to look at automation and then the, um, the overhead costs of hiring people. And and um, as we all know, in America, like our healthcare system's broken, right? We, we, it's the most expensive system in the world. And um, it's paid for in this sort of weird half government, half private way um, that, there, that basically means there's no competition, right? Um, if you go to a hospital chain or, or an insurance, uh, healthcare insurance, you can't even find what the price is. <laughs> yeah, they don't even list it. No, the price is all over the map. And then people always tell me, oh, well, when I say, well, you know, going in for a minor surgery, you know, uh, like having your toenail cut or something is $8,000 or $12,000. And then people always write me, no, no, they, you know, that's not what Medicare pays. They only pay 5000 And so it's like, oh, great. So for 10 minutes, 5000 is fair? It, it, because it wasn't twelve thousand, and it's all like, hey, come on, this is a fifty dollar operation, you know, <laughs> not right. five thousand. So this that system is so broken, but and so expensive that that the some of the burden eventually falls on the employers, right? And so then, you know, as an employer, you go, well, I could afford to hire this person, um, but once I add on all that health care and uh, social security and all the other stuff, it's like I can't make money. So um, that's if we don't fix healthcare, we can't fix our job market. That's that's a problem. And if unless you're an employer, you don't know how much it actually costs, right? So uh, like a, an employee of corporate America or the government, they see their they might pay one hundred and twenty dollars or something as their share of their health plan, and they might have a copay of you know fifteen dollars or something. And if those click higher, they they go, oh wow, my healthcare you know is going up. The actual cost is more like twelve hundred dollars, or fifteen hundred dollars, or two thousand dollars per household, right? And so, those of us who are self-employed, we have to pay the real bill, and we so we know, you know, like, uh, you know, my wife and I pay like over thirteen hundred bucks for a stripped plan, no eye care, no dental, and a fifty-dollar copay, uh, five hundred buck copay for an operation, and this is considered you know, a good plan. <laughs> it's like yeah. twenty twenty thousand $20,000 for two people is a good plan. And of course, so that, uh, that's part of the debate that, that we we're not having in our country is we need to be explicit about how expensive this is and, and, um, what we can do to really lower the cost because you can't hire people anymore in America. It's just too expensive, not from their wage, but from healthcare. Um, and then tax the tax system, and I, we we all uh, many of us had hoped that that Trump was really going to change the tax system, but he's not. Like like every every other politician, they kind of fool around with well, we're going to lower this tax rate here and there. But the bottom line is, there's still like something like seventy thousand pages of tax code, sixty nine thousand pages of which are all corporate tax breaks. <laughs> so, you know, unless unless we simplify the tax system and, and r dramatically lower the cost of the whole tax system for not only for households, but for companies, then it's um, it's cheaper and, and more profitable to play all these games. Right. Like um, have your have your corporate profits funneled through Ireland or um, the Cayman Islands or whatever. And so we would need to radically simplify our tax system, and that would make it easier to hire people here for sure. But it seems like Congress, I mean, government, they don't want to do any of this. They, they don't want to move on anything. To me, it seems like they're just happy the way it is. We'll just keep borrowing money. We'll just keep paying out. And to me, it feels like at this point, it feels like we need to maybe reset the entire system. Maybe we should let the asset bubbles just go and, you know what, we need to start over here. I think that's what we're, we've been discussing here is just living yeah. on the, the, the national credit card, like just everybody borrowing more money to keep afloat. Obviously, that's, that's not really a healthy, sustainable system, right? And it creates a lot of, of inequality. That's, uh, that's another 
like negative outcome of this thing is is a lot of people are poorer and a and a the top echelon is much much richer right because that the credit machine impoverishes everybody that that had to borrow money right and it enriches everybody who who owns the the lending machine right so like if you and I could each borrow a billion dollars from the fed at you know 0.25% like a quarter of 1% and then we can loan it out at 3% well hey we're going to pocket like 30 30 million dollars a year for doing nothing so that's the kind of power of leverage once once the central banks enable financiers and corporations to borrow at almost nothing and then lend that money out or buy back their shares then then that in, it greatly enriches the very top of the of the wealth power pyramid and then as you say that all that wealth buys democracy and that democracy of course is in quotes because <laughs> yes. we yeah we have a pay to play system and that's been shown in various studies right that that um, when when politicians g go through the motions of of passing laws the um, the impact on the bottom 95 percent it just doesn't doesn't come into their calculation because um, the bottom 95 percent don't fund uh, fund their campaigns. They don't pay for the lobbyists and 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 the rest of the machinery. So yeah, clearly we need a system reset, and it's just a question of what's going to force that reset. One thing that that might it might maybe maybe it will come down to cryptocurrencies because I mean they, they've been taking off. I mean a lot of people are saying that they're in bubbles and you know they're going to be crashing, but it is a decentralized system where the central bank doesn't really have control of it, and we can see that many people really don't understand it. Many people are not in cryptocurrencies right now. What I'm looking at right now is that maybe this may be a way to force the government, the central bank, maybe get rid of the central bank into doing what we want because, and I was discussing uh, this with you um, uh, in the pre-interview, cryptocurrency, this is not part of the Federal Reserve system. It's not a Federal Reserve note. And if employers start using this and they start paying people in cryptocurrency, and then people use this to pay for goods and they live off it and they never exchange it for dollars, it seems to me that, well, since we're not using their currency system, then this cannot be taxed. I mean, at least at this point. And this would put pressure on the government. It would put pressure on the central bank. I, I just wanted to get your take on, on this whole thing. To start with your first question, um, as I understand it, and I'm no expert, I do use cryptocurrency. I do own a bit um, and I've used it to pay people um, in other countries. Uh, I paid um, to um, software guys in Venezuela to translate one of my books into Spanish. And uh, Bitcoin made the whole thing really easy. You know, no wire transfers, no $35 fees, no filing any paper with the federal government to prove that I wasn't, you know, dealing drugs or something. All that stuff just goes away. You know, you, you, it's, it's very easy to pay people with, with cryptocurrency. And, and you need a wallet and, and that kind of stuff. Um, but it's, it's becoming a lot easier. And um, so as I'm just an amateur, right? I'm not an expert in cryptocurrencies. But my understanding is the federal government considers Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies a, f a commodity. So it's kind of like a, a futures, uh, it's like an option on copper or it's a, it's a, it's an oil contract or, you know, it's, it's considered a commodity. So if you trade it and you make money, then you, you do have to report that. Um, and, uh, th I think that's becoming clear, like the federal government, um, uh, you know, demanded some the records from one of the larger uh, Bitcoin um, wallet companies here in the United States, and so we kind of see that coming. And and I myself, um, I didn't trade Bitcoin as a speculator. It I was buying it in order to pay people, right? But I ended up making like eight hundred bucks <laughs> because you know Bitcoin was going up, right? And so I decided to report it because um, I don't want any hassles with the federal government. And so, uh, but, but all of this is, is, is in flux. In other words, um, the, the US-based uh, companies that, that uh, uh, are wallets, you know, that where you can buy and sell Bitcoin or, or Ethereum or Dash, you know, uh, many of them are starting to report your, your sales and, and so that you can report your, your gains. But to your point, 
imagine if if you were just getting your 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 cryptocurrency in, as as a payment uh, from your employer or from somebody who's paying you for a service you did, and then you go buy stuff with it. Um, well, it, maybe you didn't have a gain, you know, because you you bought and sold it, you know, in a few minutes, and so you don't have to report a gain because you didn't really have a gain. You were just using this this currency, and I think you're onto something here that it really bypasses the entire system. And and what's what makes Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies unique is it's not based on debt you know and sure. that um and so there's no interest due and so that's the thing about the central banks is they create money out of thin air and then they buy a bond and so there's an asset and a liability but ultimately somebody somebody in the system is having to pay interest on that money and so the um uh, the cryptocurrencies, you can say, well, they have no in, intrinsic value. They're just a string of, of, of characters, right? True. But at least we don't pay interest on their existence. <laughs> so that's already a positive. And, and as you pointed out, it's decentralized. And so um, I have this ongoing debate with a lot of my techie uh, friends uh, about whether the governments can really crush cryptocurrencies or totally control them. And a lot of people think, oh, yeah, they can do it. You know, the NSA f tracks everything and they know exactly how many Bitcoins you own and every transaction you ever did. And that, that may be true. I don't know. Uh, but but the, the, the fact is that these uh, cryptocurrencies are, are managed um, in a distributed fashion. So the, the, the blockchain is actually distributed over thousands of computers around the world. And so it's pretty tough to say I'm going to I'm going to control that whole system, right? Uh, I I don't I don't know if it's possible and as as to your question, maybe governments are going to separate into wise governments who are going to get on board and 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 and, uh, and um allow and enable cryptocurrencies to thrive in their economies or they're going to try to suppress it and and I think the if governments attempt to suppress it I think they're going to be big time losers they're going to lose the economic vitality that that comes with uh the decentralized uh cryptocurrencies where do you think everything is headed as we move throughout this year do you think anything will improve do you think the economy is going to enter a recession or depression where do you think everything is going I'll, I'll just share my personal opinion and I'll try to explain what it's based on is, you know, it's funny. We've seen like this eight year cycle uh, and you could you could start anywhere you want. And it's kind of a parlor game to to choose the cycle beginnings and endings. But obviously we had a we had a, an enormous uh uh, asset bubble in the late 90s, right? And then that was the dot-com boom and the, and the start of the housing boom. And then that, that blew up in 2000, 2001, right? And then we had a deep recession. Then now, eight years after that, after the government and central banks did all their stimulus and, you know, pump up credit, blah, blah, then we get another bubble and, and that bubble pops in 2008, 2009. Now we have the same response, right? That the central banks and the central governments have, you know, it, borrowed trillions of dollars into existence to spend and and pump into the financial system, and here we are at, at another bubble, right? Credits in a bubble, housing's in a bubble, stocks are in a bubble, bonds are in a bubble, um, and a lot of people think cryptocurrencies are in a bubble. I I disagree. I think they're barely getting started, but. Um, so all these bubbles exist and people are not making any more money than they were eight years ago. They're actually making less money. And so how is this going to end? Well, I think we're starting to see how it's going to end already. Like retail stores are closing by the apparently thousands, right? I mean, aren't those yes. numbers like 1,200 stores and dozens of, of big, of once thriving uh, re retailers are going to go bankrupt. We're seeing housing starting to roll over, at least in the sense of sales are declining, suggesting that the pool of available buyers is shrinking. So there's no, there's no buying power left to push housing higher. And this is what happens when you, when you've run a credit bubble to the end, right? You run out of, 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 of credit worthy borrowers, then you tap the pool of, you know, marginal, uh, borrowers that we were talking about subprime. And once you've exhausted that pool, there's nobody left. And so then what happens is sales plummet, 
which we see in retail, we see in autos and vehicles, and we see it in asset purchases. So if that process picks up speed and it appears to be picking up speed, then it looks to me like a global recession is baked in. And we're starting to see signs that China's um, shadow banking system is starting to come apart at the seams, which um, a lot of people have expected for quite a while. And so, you know, it's kind of like a story of extremes can always become more extreme, but that doesn't mean that they're sustainable or healthy, right? It just means that the, the day of reckoning has been pushed forward. And so it feels to me like the day of reckoning has been pushed forward for eight years, and now it's finally, um, it's finally coming apart at the seams. And so I think we are going to have a global recession. And the old, uh, the old tricks that, that they've run for 20 years, which is, you know, lower interest rates, and pump money into the financial system, those aren't going to work because they've already, they've already used those tools. You know, the interest rates are already at zero or negative in, in much of the world. So, and what's the Fed going to do? Drop interest rates a quarter percent and think that's going to save the economy? I mean, it's a joke. So we have to prepare for how are we going to survive a normal business cycle recession, which is overdue. Charles, thank you very much for being on the X-22 Report Spotlight. Once again, how can people see your work? Uh, please visit me at oftwominds.com, and uh, you can read uh, sample chapters of my books and, and look at my archives. And uh, stop by oftwominds.com. Charles, once again, thank you very much. I really appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. <laughs> 